Hello and welcome to Volume 3 of Drink the Music. I'm Brian here as always with Michaela and Michaela. Uh, as far as musicians and concerts and I don't know, just like in this ethos of popular culture um, in America, in the whole world right now, it doesn't get much bigger than Taylor Swift. That's true. Um, there, There is a... I wouldn't say a cult following because that makes it sound like it's this underground thing. There's this very overground, very, <laughs> very like all over everywhere you look. There are twisties everywhere. Sorry, Swifties. I don't know what that is. Twisties. I, twisties. I don't know. That's what a tie saying. that comes on your bread. You're, Swifties. That's right. Come on, Michaela. Get Swifties. It straight. That's right. We're, gonna, oh we're already God. losing. Listeners are dropping off left <laughs> and right gonna, already. For they're going to crucify me. Don't. Sorry. Um, so there are Swifties. There's like definitions of what makes a Swiftie versus not a Swiftie. A lot of gatekeeping about Taylor Swift. Um, mm. But basically, she has become this new face of like women singer songwriter empowerment. It, it, like. Uh, her music has gone from being like really fun, like country pop to like a, a, a political, geopolitical like phenom that uh, I don't know if we're going to see any uh, in our lifetime again. Um, it's been really amazing watching this transformation take place and being in uh, the the city and time that we are where, you know, she's been taking the entire country by storm. Neither one of us mm -hmm. has seen her yet in concert, but um, there are people that are literally, literally spending thousands of dollars to get like nosebleed seats just so they can breathe in the same air space that she has. <laughs> it's been, it's really, it, this has got to be like what Elvis was like, maybe. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And her current concert that she's doing uh, right now, the Eras Tour, um, is really neat because it goes through the, uh, you know, different eras of Taylor Swift, who has reinvented herself several times. So who is Taylor Swift? Uh, Taylor Allison Swift was born, as you might have guessed it, in 1989. A uh, little nudge to that album title there. Um, she already had seven albums under her belt uh, when we got to Folklore here in 2020. Um, and with those seven albums, she had 10 Grammy wins, uh, like a thousand grammy nominations um and two of those first seven albums one album of the year uh spoiler warning folklore also going to win album of the year um and then you get to the year 2020 we are in lockdown and a very surprise comes out on everyone's uh streaming service of choice that is the folklore album it comes out and it takes over the whole world the whole of the internet uh everyone loses their freaking minds for taylor swift again as per usual but you know to get into something as monumental as folklore or uh, this Grammy winning uh, epic uh, folk tale uh, song journey that we're about to go on. We're going to need a cocktail and you found a really fun one. It is it is gorgeous. It is tasty um, and I'm excited to talk about it. So let's take a quick break. We'll mix one of those up and we'll be right back to chat about it. So this week's cocktail is called the Starry Night Granita, which sounds very like Van Goghish, uh, obviously, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. maybe, and maybe, and it's, it's, it does bring colors of like the Van Gogh Starry Night, um, art, um, True. here at Drink the Movies, we do a lot of art forms, but I want, um, to talk about this piece because I remember when I showed this to you, I was like, I don't know. I think this would be really good for folklore because it's, it's got this embodiment of like a light and dark side to it. Um, mm -hmm. much like what we're going to talk about with the music. Um, it pairs, it's got kind of a soft piece and like a heavy piece to it um and how as you say taylor swift has reinvented herself more times than madonna now uh which 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 is a big feat uh right and done so successfully and how that mix of kind of ballad writing and um songwriting and the attention to detail and all the lyrics and um how all of that kind of creates this beautiful concoction and looks amazing and uh, and it really, this drink uh, is all of those things in one. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we made a few subtle changes to this because this has this original recipe calls for violet syrup. And uh, I don't know about you, Brian, I could not find violet syrup, um, but mm -hmm. I could find lavender, which I hear is uh, one of Taylor Swift's favorite um, flavor profiles anyway. So as an homage to her, we decided to, uh, I made mine with uh, lavender syrup. So yeah, yeah this is... I, yeah, absolutely. I did uh, mine with lavender syrup um, as well. We weren't able to get together to mix these one up. 
these ones up, uh, but that's okay. Cause then we can talk about kind of the differences and the way we put these uh, together. But yeah, I went lavender with mine too. Um, if you want to do violet syrup, uh, you're going to make it the same way. Uh, you're just going to, you know, use violet flowers as opposed to uh, the lavender flowers or lavender tea is what I used um, for mine. You can get those maybe from your local flower shop. You could definitely order uh, violet flower petals like online to make your own uh, syrup if you want to go that route. But I thought that the lavender uh, here was really nice. And obviously the color kind of set off and uh, was really luxurious tasting. Um, I like this one quite a bit, but it is a little bit of work. Um, this is kind of a blended uh, thing. So you're going to need to get yourself a blender if you want to do this, do this right. And it's going to be kind of in two phases. I'm going to talk about the first phase here. This is the base layer. It's going to be kind of this, this, I don't know, like pale golden yellow kind of color in the bottom of your glass. Um, I made mine in like a Nutribullet or you could use just a regular uh, blender, you know, kind of whatever you have to to crush up your ice here. You could probably even literally just crush up some ice with like a mallet um, and like one of those like uh, ice bag uh, things that you crush that up with and, and mix this up here a little bit if you wanted to. But you're basically going to take uh, one pear and go ahead and peel that and chop it up into some little cubes, throw that into your blender, uh, put in a tablespoon roughly of honey and about a half cup of ice. And you're going to blend that until it's kind of this this chunky concoction um, and that's how I did the first time which is more of this granita uh, sort of thing um, I also made this a second time where I blended it basically just smooth just like like smoothie uh, level there uh, to have outside by the pool and I liked both of them the granita one was a little bit tougher to drink um, but it was a little you know, it was much prettier in the glass doing it that way so that's how you're going to create your base layer there uh, the pear some honey and the ice blend that up pour it in your glass and then you're ready for step two yeah, and step two uh, is really beautiful. It's this dark, uh, it uses Empress Gin. In fact, this recipe comes from the Empress Gin website. Um, so you can find it. Uh, it's Empress 1908, which is beautiful. Um, so you're going to take two ounces of your 1908 Empress Gin. That's a beautiful like indigo color. You're going to take an ounce of uh, either violet or lavender syrup, which is what we used. And you're going to use um, a drop of floral bitters. Now, what does that mean? Um, bitters is generally bitter, but it comes from a bunch of different stuff. So mm -hmm. you can get like orange bitters is really uh, prevalent. Uh, Angostura has like this aromatic bitters. Um, if you go to a liquor store and you ask for bitters, it's uh, not alcoholic, but um, they will be, they'll have ones that are like hibiscus. They'll have ones for lavender. Um, mm -hmm. I was really lucky in that I didn't have to go get anything special because I had some lavender hibiscus honey bitters, I think is what I used. And so mm -hmm. you just need a drop of it. It's very, very faint. Um, and it's just going to add kind of a, an extra, I don't know, dimension to this. And then you're going to blend that. And then you're going to layer that on top of your uh, pear concoction that's on the bottom. It's this really dark purple um, kind of, a frappuccino looking thing, right? And then mm -hmm. um, you're going to garnish that with some uh, orange zest. And it looks absolutely stunning. And I feel like um, if, you know, this isn't a forest drink, like the looking at the art uh, from the vinyl itself, there, it's a lot of like grays and she's in this forest. It's, it's kind of a, almost a- um, It's very woodsy. Yeah. Yeah. Very woodsy. And this is not that. Um, there's a, there were, there are a lot of cocktails out there, uh, that pay homage to this, to this album in a very woodsy way. We went a different direction and I, and I'm kind of glad we did because I think what this does do is this gives us like a couple of different dimensions of dark and lightness. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, it's, it's also really, really hot where we are. So this was <laughs> really, really fun to listen to on my back porch. Um, while you know i'm drinking this not melting to death because <laughs> yep, i feel right. like where when she was making it she was somewhere not melting so yeah hopefully hopefully she was uh she was not melting when she was making this yeah this was very lovely it's very delicate that the pear um is this very very light and fragile uh kind of flavor and that's a lot of the things that you get here um in this album that you know kind of looks at life during uh lockdown and what it means to you know have put out all these albums uh leading up to it so this is a really good one give it a try um i think aesthetically it looked really great um next to the album cover and kind of captured those uh more ethereal notes uh that you get throughout the album as well so give this one a try let us know what you think about this one or uh, if you have any other good 
cocktail recommendations for folklore, definitely send those our way. But uh, right now, Michaela, we need to take a quick break. We have to mix up another one of these granitas. Um, we have to get back to talk about this because there are 16 tracks here on folklore. So let's take a quick break and we'll be right back to chat about it. All right. So today we are talking about Taylor Swift's 2020 album, Folklore. Um, and I have this on the vinyl LP. It's a double LP. So there's actually four sides. We're still going to be uh, kind of going through this first um, first half of the album here before we take a quick little break to run through some of the album stuff, you know, just like we've been doing the first couple of episodes here. But uh, side A of this is the one cardigan, the last great American dynasty and exile. Uh, so let's start with the one, Michaela. Um, I really uh, like this. It's probably my second favorite song from the whole album. Um, it starts kind of on the simple, uh, just kind of piano chords that uh, give way to kind of this almost like very melancholy and regretful sounding like pop melody. Um, and I think that it really does a good job of kind of setting you up tonally for what this album is going to be. Um, like we said, this was definitely a uh, kind of transition from Taylor who had gone, you know, from country music to, to pop music to like almost like synth, like dance type of music. Um, and now we're going into um, this more folk and, um, uh, very loosely into like folk rock but i and I, it gets you tonally there and i think it gets you there in terms of uh taylor swift's mindset going into this album as well yeah i totally agree i mean i think uh she talks a little bit about this in in an interview that i was able to look at and you know this is a great start to this album um, you and I kind of process music very differently but i like to think of you when we're doing these because i'll actually i'll put them album on from beginning to end, just kind of process it that way. Um, and I really like the way that this sets you up for the album that you're about to listen to. Um, they talk about, uh, Taylor talks about the fact that the first uh, words that you're going to hear are, I'm doing good. I'm on some new stuff, right? Um, I've been saying yes, instead of no, when, you know, when you think about where and how this was written and how this was put together in the middle of lockdown, like some people were, uh, having to reinvent what it was that they were doing because they physically couldn't do the things that they were used to be doing, like going out or working or, you know, mm. and um, really setting this uh, album up for the journey of, uh, of what that time was like, um, maybe for artists um, around the world and how, you know, it's almost forcing them to not necessarily reinvent themselves, but just figure out what's most important and how they're going to process. Um, I love this song um, just because I, I think, um, you know, generically, everybody who's heard this has thought of someone that they liked. Um, that's like, you know, that would have been great if that relationship uh, had lasted. This is definitely about, you know, a romantic relationship. But when you think about, um, you know, in being in, in the situation where you're looking back on your days and it's like, man, when I was in my 20s, what, wouldn't this was really cool and what we had was really special um, and mm -hmm. not necessarily wanting to go back and and having this having things change. But wondering that if you had made one small change, would have everything changed? Um, and I really love the way that that where that thought takes me, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because I've had a lot of people that I'm like, hey, that'd be fun to have had them been the one. I don't know. Um, right. But yeah, I think this was one of my favorite songs on the album. Um, and this whole first side is really special in that I think it sets you up for a much deeper conversation that you're going to have with yourself as you get further down along the tracks. Yeah, absolutely. This uh, this first kind of turn of the album here, these first four songs are all really incredible. Um, and that first one gives way to track number two, Cardigan, which was the lead single um, off of the album. Um, it's also part of this teenage love triangle uh, kind of song arc that we have throughout the album. And I really like that the songs aren't together. Uh, they're just kind of placed sporadically uh, throughout the album. But this one is the first one here um, uh, with August and Betty being the, uh, the second part. Um, I really like how this Cardigan is kind of like this pop song, but it's really stripped down to kind of this this very simple you know, kind of acoustic guitar and piano bit um it's got some ambient synth a little bit of uh, drums and the piano and then it goes into kind of like this orchestral piece uh, which is really great um and i do love kind of in the chorus here um it ends with uh i right so like give me your weekends i which goes on and it's uh, part of this chorus and it kind of it kind of like pulls you in because you expect like the eye to lead into something uh, but it's not it just kind of goes out there and lingers um and gives you this really um kind of intense feeling of longing as we kind of look at the first character in this uh love triangle 
Yeah. Yeah. I, and I mean, you know, one of the things that makes Taylor so amazing is her, um, her lyrics are just uh, amazing. I mean, she has this way and I, I don't want to say that she's like um, the next Joni Mitchell, because I don't think that that's fair to either artist, but I really think that the lyrics that people remember, it's very, it hits you the same way um, in very much the same way. And when, uh, you know, the whole idea of being picked up like a piece uh, of something that no one wanted and being loved and the way in which uh, Taylor describes that in a way that's super accessible for everybody um, listening to her songs is really special um, and is probably one of the reasons why she has done so well um, in all of the, all of her albums, because she has kept that from when she was 15 to now. Um, mm -hmm. And that um, this, this song is so it's really special because I, I think you're right. I think when we, when I think about this, I think about um, this longing of someone who's much older, who's thinking about back about this, um, time period and saying, I knew you and I knew that it was going to be fine, but man, that really hurt. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I, you did these things and you hurt me. Um, and I knew that you would come back. I knew that this was actually what you wanted all along, but you're the way in which it's sent, it's sent back to you over time. It's like an older person saying it. I, I don't feel like this is the 16 year old version of the girl saying it. I think this is someone who's in their fifties <laughs> that is like, yeah, I, I knew, I, I, I knew then that you were going to do these things and then you would come back. And then I would still um, want you to pick me up. Like I was an old piece of trash and say that I was your favorite thing. <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, so we go from kind of that tale to a more, um, actual uh, true to life tale here for uh, Taylor and track number three, the last great American dynasty. Uh, this is the story of Rebecca Harkness, who is this uh, heiress to this giant fortune, um, kind of an eccentric uh, character. Um, and Taylor Swift bought her house and decided that uh, one day she wanted to write a song about this character. Um, and she ended up doing that just here. Um, I really like uh, Jack Antonoff, who, um, is a, a member of the bleachers but a, a very much a co-collaborator uh, with taylor swift kind of throughout all of her albums he said that um in an interview he said that it's the perfect moment of what the album intended to be um it's a song that's not about her but it really is all about her um that's exactly what it is it's kind of talking about this woman as kind of the eccentric uh person um and the way that people responded to her and you know kind of paralleling uh that with taylor's you know kind of own life and you know, her life in the you know, the paparazzi and stuff like that. Uh, this one's a little bit more upbeat than the first two tracks, which makes it stand out a bit here um, in this first side, um, I think. Uh, but it, it's really good. It tells a really great story. Um, this is a a very tried and true uh, folk song, uh, sort of sort of standard here. Uh, you're telling a story and that's what this one does. Yeah. Uh, and it does it well. I mean, you can't go wrong with Taylor Swift ballads. They're all amazing. I mean, some of uh, in her era's tours, she covers uh, a lot of them because they're so great. Um, I think the dedication that she takes to some of the some of the guitar licks is really amazing, too. Um, it really capitalizes on kind of that folksy sound. Um, but it's also the one of the more upbeat ones, which is great because uh, then we get into Exile, which is the next track. Um, and that is not, <laughs> that is not upbeat. That is, that is like bottom of the barrel, depression, <laughs> sadness. I, I feel, I mean, it's, it's a roller coaster on this, but it's mostly down. It's going, we're going down. We're going down we're, from here. We're, we're on the way down. So track four, yeah, Exile. It's, uh, this one features Bon Iver, um, who is not, uh, artist I'm super familiar with, to be honest. Um, but every time I hear anything uh, that's featuring Bon Iver or anything by them, I'm like, why don't I listen to this more? Because this sounds brilliant and uh, audibly like delicious sounding. So I need to check that out um, a little bit more. Um, so this is kind of this duet piece. Um, and I really love kind of the contrast here um, of the voices. Bon Iver's voice is deep as all get out. Uh, Taylor is still singing pretty deep, but it sounds like a thousand octaves higher than, uh, you know, uh, the Bon Iver uh, part here. And it's kind of kind of this... Uh, 
kind of this bookend, I think, for the for the first turn. Um, you know, the first song, it kind of looks at like former lovers, you know, pretending to be OK, kind of putting on this brave face, you know, leaning into to change and being by yourself. But this one, I think, is a little bit more of like an internal dialogue, like like you see like your your ex flame and you're like, yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing all these things. But then as you're walking away, you're like, oh, man, that was that was real rough. <laughs> really not into that. Um, I love the way that the voices come in and out, especially at the end. They're singing kind of in these turns. Uh, it gives the song almost like this uh, like corral uh kind of kind of sense to it as they're layering over top of these and then um maybe my favorite little bit here um is the end where bon Iver is singing um you never gave a warning sign and taylor is saying so many signs and they're kind of layering over each other it's super haunting sounding uh and i love it this is uh maybe tied for my my first favorite my first uh favorite track of the album uh it's really good yeah no, I, I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, the way it's layered and you have these two sides of the story, right? So she's thinking that she gave all these signs. She gave so many signs as to why this wasn't working or why she wasn't happy or whatever. And he's like, you gave no signs. I am completely bereft and devastated. And she's also devastated. Um, and so I imagine that this is like happening at a party where they weren't expecting to see each other. And maybe one of them had had this idea about, hey, it, it would have been fun if you would have been the one like in this kind of romantic way and uh, thinking about uh, the past and past relationships. But then when you see each other and you're like, oh, I, I remember how this went. Oh, yeah, this is not going to be good. And um, feeling like when a relationship ends, especially if it's been a really long term one, um, and this is a recurring theme, I think, through the whole album. Um you know, no one knows you better, perhaps. No one knows how to hurt you more. Um, but also no one knows how to love you the same. And so, you know, there's that feeling of you're not my homeland anymore. Why am I defending this? Why am I offending you? Like, we're not together, but I still feel these these strings, these invisible strings, we'll get there, um, to, to, to each other, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, this this I remember hearing this song for the first time um, and it was not because I was a Swifty when this came out. I was way late in the game and I'm sorry, um, but I heard this on the radio and I remember having to pull over to have a good cry because at the end, this hauntingness of uh, Bon Iver's um, voice is just so deep and the the registers the the difference between him and taylor is so vast and yet it blends so beautifully and to think about the fact that when they did this they did this um away from each other they weren't in the same studio they were in a they were on the, it, other states they were recording this mm -hmm. uh using uh technical equipment and they weren't in the same space so to be able to create this feverish um, chemistry that makes you sad and mournful and also hopeful at the same time is just beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that is where kind of that side A, uh, that first vinyl uh, comes to an end. So you got to flip it over here to get to my favorite track on the album, track number five, My Tears Ricochet. Uh, this is track five, uh, which she said in a bunch of albums. So I had to look that up, not being a Swifty myself. I'm like, what is that? What is the significance of a track five? And apparently uh, that is the place where Taylor puts um, kind of her most emotional and vulnerable uh song on the album there as track number five so this is my tears ricochet um i really love the um kind of the imagery on this one where it's talking about um you know kind of this um i don't know she described it as like this like like superhero nemesis and and this is talking mostly kind of about uh that music uh agent uh you know, kind of a relationship that went bad and uh, is now, you know, forcing her to basically re-record all of her uh, first albums. And it's kind of about that, but it, it uh, she describes it as like this, like superhero thing where you have like the superhero and the supervillain and they can't really exist without each other. Um, and I really liked kind of thinking about it that way. So I, I really love kind of the imagery uh, through this. And I really like um, this song in particular. It kind of has this really subtle crescendo that keeps popping up throughout the uh, song, um, but it never really hits. You expect it to just kind of explode into this big, um, almost anthem or um you know kind of this 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 big sort of thing and it, it just never really quite gets there it's something that uh radiohead does a lot in their songs which is something that i really like it just leaves you like like expecting and like almost like salivating for this thing that never never quite happens and it shows like a tremendous amount of restraint um yeah my favorite album or my favorite song on the album uh my tears ricochet what do you think about this one michaela 
So this, this one, uh, again, I think I had to listen to it a couple of times, I think, because it was so overwhelming to me because the lyrics are amazing. Um, I, the way that you talked about this this buildup that never happens, it was very symbolic to me because sometimes when relationships change or end um, and they're incredibly painful, you don't get the closure that you would like. And at listening to this, I wanted a lot of closure. <laughs> you know, I wanted that release somehow. Um, and it didn't didn't really happen. Um, you know, I likened this to like divorce or uh, like a friendship that ended that is decades old where again you have these it's like do you remember this time when we were best friends and you would have never hurt me and now it's like all i'm doing is telling everybody how horrible you are and cursing your name and how, how they should have done something else with them with them and and how that is like when i thought of my tears ricochet like those feelings and those words, how they bounce off of the person that is meant to hurt, but also other people are hurt. Um, mm -hmm. And how it, it kind of reverberates through either your friend group or your family or, um, you know, the music community, whatever, whatever this is about, right. And how that kind of reverberates and where you have to think about what you want in, in at the end of this. And like you said, if you can't live without the person, um, because either you have a kid together, cause that's where it kind of went, or you can't live without them because, you know, you still are making music with them and you have a contract or whatever it is mm -hmm. to be able to, um, to, to heal. And I definitely think that this was, um, a very vulnerable place that she put herself in Taylor. Um, and she continues to do that because she trusts herself. And I think she trusts her audience to give her that vulnerability and still love her for it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was overwhelmed by the bravery of this because this one was very, felt very different than like you hurt me and I'm hurt. <laughs> right. It's very bigger, but very much larger. Yeah, that one to me feels like it could play out um, and be an important piece for a lot of people, depending on, you know, kind of what they're going through or their situation in life. Um, really, really one of my favorites there. Um, and it goes into track number six, Mirror Mall. Um, we're going to be talking about this a little bit more, but, um, you know, Folklore was kind of this uh, surprise release during the pandemic. Um, and this song kind of addresses what that is, right? If you're if you're an artist, if you're a entertainer, if you're a creator and you feel like your place on this earth is, you know, entertaining and um providing you know some sort of escape for people um what does that mean when like that platform gets taken away from you um and that's kind of what what this uh track is is meant to kind of you know symbolize like what it, you can be taylor swift but you know if all of those those platforms and things get taken away from you then then what uh where are you left um and i'm kind of torn on mirror ball um i really like the inspiration i really love the messaging of the song but i don't like the way just that the song sounds um is not particularly interesting to me so I, to me i mirror ball is probably my least favorite song on the album but i i really like kind of the the intention behind it it just it just musically it didn't didn't connect with me for whatever reason so I really, I don't know. I think I agree in, in some aspects because I love some of the lyrics. Um, and I love the idea that um, when you think about a mirror ball, first of all, in 2023, uh, I don't know how many times you've been to a, a skating rink uh, lately, but uh, there's that's the, that's the only time I've seen a mirror ball in probably the last 10 years that the, they're at a skating rink, right? And it's brought down and the light shined on it and it's just for certain times and then it goes back up to its little corner of the room and no one looks at it. And um, I bet people that aren't celebrities also feel that way because mm -hmm. um, they're only uh, fit for public consumption in certain ways. And when we're in the middle of a pandemic, right. And we're all, you know, shuttered and it's like, well, what do I have to say? What, what really matters to me? And I love the lyrics. You'll find me on my tallest tiptoes spinning on my highest heels, like um, in a situation where you're just, you're supposed to be in the corner doing nothing and you still have that need for attention. Um, personally, I love attention 
a lot. <laughs> so I have to work really hard to like not steal it from others and things like that. Um, so I really love that aspect of it. Um, those, those chords really hit me, but I think you're right. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's probably not my favorite, but I love that she was so self-aware that that's where her, that's where she was and uh, and shared that thought with us because she could have easily done what a lot of people did which was like yeah the pandemic sucks but here's what i'm gonna do instead and and mm -hmm. try and you know um not look at it as something that's just a weird dynamic that that was going on for i don't know millions of people all over the world yeah, for sure. Uh, so that is Mirrorball, and it goes into track number seven, uh, which is uh, titled Seven. Um, and uh, I like this. Uh, it's kind of a retelling of like this childhood friendship uh, story. And there's a line that says, and just like a folk song, our love will be passed on. Uh, so that is a a nice little uh, uh, note, little tip of the cap to uh, kind of the content here of this album um, and folklore. Um, I really like this song. Um, it, it's really interesting. Again, it's, you know, kind of telling the story, uh, same as, you know, the last great American dynasty. Um, so very, you know, folk music in that sense. Um, but I really like she she's singing this uh, very low register. Um, and her voice range in it is really minimal. I like the whole thing takes place within like one octave um, of her voice. It, it does trail up a couple of times, but all the storytelling is done within this octave. Um, and that is something that the national does a lot. Um, he plays around like kind of one very small, you know, three or four note range throughout a song. Um, so this song uh, seven uh, sounded a lot like that. And I thought that it was, I just thought that it sounded um, very interesting um, in that sense. So, yeah, this was probably one of the ones that was most lost on me. I liked it, but it, it's it's not um, super long. It's only about three and a half minutes long. So when I was listening to it, um, I found myself having to go back and re-listen to it because I would just, it sounded to me kind of like a, a bookend, which makes sense because this would be the end of the first half, right? Um, I, I, like, I like the lyrics. I think that... Um, but this one I, it gets a little muddled to me if you're listening to it on Spotify or, or on, you know, another music listening track where you're not having to stop and turn it over as a mm -hmm. as a record, um, because it just kind of hangs there at the end. Um, but I, I, I do like it. Um, I think you said everything that needs to be said about the lyrics. I mean, the lyrics are pretty great. Um, and, yeah. and it's definitely like what a seven year old would say where it's like I've been meaning to tell you I think your house is haunted don't don't tell your seven-year-old friends that their house is haunted but um some of the striking lyrics like your mad is your dad is always mad like things you can't get past uh, a seven-year-old and then what what they remember over time is mm -hmm. kind of haunting yeah. <laughs> you know yeah I could see if you were listening to this just as a single or just kind of have it on in the background where it would almost sound pretty monotone because that vocal range is really minimal um by I find it fascinating because if you're Taylor Swift, you um, have a crazy vocal range um, and, you know, especially, you know, in singing like these big like pop anthems and these big like dance tracks and, you know, you're going nuts at the high range of your, you know, hitting these uh, high octave notes and stuff like that um, to, to really strip it down. It sounds you know, very bare bones. And um, I like that aspect of it. Um, and it goes into track number eight to August, uh, which is the uh, second track here of this love triangle kind of thing. So uh, the first one in Cardigan, it's told from kind of the girl's perspective. And then this one is uh, told from the perspective of like the fling uh, that her boyfriend ends up having uh, kind of at the end of the summer. Um, I really like the song. Um, it kind of is like this, like more of like this lovey like pop song kind of a thing uh but when the bridge comes in it kind of it kind of swells up and it changes the perspective of the song a little bit which i like a lot um where it's kind of telling the story but then it kind of gets thrown on its head um and it's it's basically talking about you know this thing is kind of this you know it was the summer fling right in august that we're having but it it kind of changes from it was this fling to i really fell in love with this guy um even though it was just a fling to him like i was kind of head over heels and um it was really kind of kind of emotionally captivating on that sense. So uh, that's August. Uh, what do you think about this one? Um, yeah, this was, this one was really, 
amazing to me. I I love all three of these kind of uh, perspective ones from this love triangle that we got going on, right? Um, because we are told as children, especially as women, that like if someone steals your man, then they are you know a bunch of words that we weren't going to say here, and they're bad people. And um, but what if that's not how that goes down ninety percent of the time? Uh, and I really like that this put a layer to that where this is um this is a girl who uh I, I you know it doesn't say anything about how she meant to hurt this other person or anything like that she just uh really liked this guy um and mm -hmm. they had this summer romance and she knew it was never really mine he was never really mine um and it slipped away it just kind of we had this time and and in that moment it was real and it was you know um it was sexy and there like there's all these really amazing kind of hints of of what it was and all the things that it was um but to her like she's not a bad person like at the end of this you don't think oh you 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 stole this thing that wasn't yours she knew it wasn't hers and i don't think she meant to steal it and i i love i love that layer to it because um, in every breakup scenario where there's a love triangle, we always want to paint lines of what is good and who is bad. And, mm -hmm. and maybe it's just not that simple. And the older I get, the more I realize there, there's a lot of gray area in, right. in relationships. Yeah. And so um, I really loved this. Um, it's one of my favorites. I love um, just the chorus and the, the, at the end when we, she says, you know, the, I, back when I was living for the hope of it all. Like the hope, uh, you know, being young enough to think that your hope could live in another person. And as long as they were alive and around because you loved them so much, you could be OK. Mm -hmm. Pretty. Yeah. I don't know. Very romantic and profound to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of uh, profound and uh, personal, we go into track number nine. This is me trying. Uh, this is the closest thing probably to a pop ballad on the album uh, so far, at least. Um, it keeps kind of the same sort of like melancholy uh, instrumentation, but uh, Taylor's vocal range goes really high kind of in this one. And it's it's more of like this big um you know, uh, chorus of of her singing. Um, I, I really like the song. It speaks to me kind of personally and probably a lot of people that listen to this um, and kind of the feelings that, uh, you know, we were all having kind of in that first part of isolation where you, um, you know, have kind of this fear and you don't know what the future is going to hold. And it's very kind of self-reflective um, in that way, kind of remorseful in that way, but also at the same time accepting that, you know, uh, this this is me trying. And sometimes, you know, trying your best is the best that you can do. Um, so I, I really Really love kind of the messaging of that. Like I said, yeah, you know, I could connect with it very personally. And I imagine, um, you know, when this came out in 2020, that a lot of people were probably experiencing those same emotions. Yeah, it, I think it's hard. Um, this this one hit me especially hard, too, because I think, you know, when we uh, Taylor talked to this about this in an interview um, around kind of addiction. And, you know, if someone's like, hey, I'm really trying and it's still not good enough uh, to meet your expectations or society's expectations. But, um, and I've worked so exhaustingly hard to like not take a drink or not do drugs or to, to fit in uh, and, and meet other people socially where they're, they're, they're expecting me to be. And I've worked so hard and I still have so far to go. Um, it's just this kind of hopeless feeling and um it was kind of, I feel like in the roller coaster, <laughs> in the roller coaster of this album, this was probably the lowest of the low. Um, and where I felt definitely um, kind of it's at rock bottom. And I love that this had nothing to do with a, like a relationship or a lot, a long, a love that's gone wrong or anything like that. It's just, Hey, this is really hard. Um, and I'm, I am trying and this is me trying and that's going to look different than what it looks like when you try Brian or when, mm -hmm. you know, any of our listeners try, like some people they're going to try and it's going to look a lot easier than it is for some. I don't think that it is actually any easier. I think it is just a, a, a kind of a, a crapshoot or a roll of the dice is how hard it is. Um, and it's hard for everybody. And at least they're, you know, at the same time, this person is like, at least I'm trying and I'm not giving up. Um, 
But man, this I feel like was written on like a bathroom floor when when COVID was like a month in and to lockdown mm-hmm. and we're starting to hear more about, you know, the the way that the people are running out of things that they need because they can't get to stores and just this very like isolated, lonely song. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's um, it's kind of wrenching. And like I said, it's it's very easy to connect with this um, and kind of put yourself into those lyrics. And that's where uh, this uh, first kind of half of the album ends. And we are going to have to take a quick album break to uh, flip over our vinyl or in this case, put on the uh, second vinyl um, and get into side C. Before we do that, let's talk about folklore a little bit here. Um, folklore hit one album of the year. Uh, so good job there. And it was on number one on a lot of the 2020 best of charts, uh, uh, including Billboard, Time Magazine and Rolling Stone as being the best album of the year 2020. Um, like I mentioned, this was a very much a surprise uh, kind of thing, right? So in the like the week before it came out, uh, Taylor started putting up on her Instagram just these black and white photos, which I think are the photos that ended up going on like the album cover and stuff like that. And then on July 23rd, she posts on uh, her social medias that she has a new album coming out and it came out at midnight that night. So uh, it was very much a surprise to everyone, to the record executives, to, to everyone in the whole world, except for, I guess, her and, uh, you know, her uh, producers and Bon Iver, I guess, maybe probably knew. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know for sure. Probably I don't know had for an sure. idea. Um, so like it came out to stream and then it was like a, a month is into August, I think when, um, she put out a bunch of like autograph CDs sent out to independent record shops, uh, which is awesome. Taylor has a really good track record of, uh, putting stuff out to, um, independent, you know, record shops and, uh, for, um, national like uh, record store day and stuff like that so so those went out to kind of help prop up um, some small business i know uh, one of the record shops here got those and i think they sold out in i don't know like 10 minutes or something like that and then the vinyl release came which i actually just picked up a copy of uh just a few weeks back because i'd only ever listened to it streaming um until then but uh do you remember uh when this came out michaela like did you like hear of it like around the time it came out or was it on the radio or how did you uh pick up on this one so <laughs> Um, I remember people losing their minds the week after it showed up on all social media. Um, and I have a really good friend who uh, is is completely, I don't want to say obsessed because that sounds unhealthy, but she's she's really she really loves Taylor Swift. And um, she loves to tell me this story. And I remember her the first time she ever told me the story was in Savannah, uh, listening to records. Um, she actually brought like a turntable with her, I think, and was mm. like, look, you gotta, you gotta hear all this stuff. And I was like, oh, Taylor Swift, that's, that's cool. Cause I you uh, know remember Taylor Swift from like, you know, our song and like Drew looks at me, all the country stuff. Right. So <laughs> I was like, oh, she did an album and she's like, no, 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 you gotta know. And so she told me the story and she showed me all of the, like the old, tweets things where it was like you know I a lot didn't happen this year but one thing did happen and I made an album and here it is and it's like six hours later it just shows up and everybody loses their mind um and it was this super raw moment and the way it was created where nobody could be together and then it was um months later I think where the uh, you know, everybody, uh, the small group of people that had a hand in this, uh, were able to meet and actually create like a little, uh, kind of concert. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's, it's not, uh, and you can look at it on Disney plus it's called folklore, the folk- folklore, the long pond studio sessions, um, where they go through and talk about all of the things in the folklore album, but the, it was the first time that they were able to play it together in the same room, which is insane that it sounds as good as it does. Um, so I remember that, um, but no, like in 2020, I think I was just focusing on on at mid mid year 2020. I was focusing on staying alive. Maybe I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> maybe I was in because we hadn't even started drink the music or any or drink the movies or anything like that at that point. Yeah, um, that's true. I don't know. I, I, I where was I? I was living under a rock. I don't know where I was. Yeah, we were. Uh, yeah, we were still extremely isolated. Yeah, I remember when this came out. I want to say it was on like a Saturday morning I think maybe I woke up and like I got on I don't know Instagram I think and just like I don't know like a hundred people that I follow on there had posted that they'd already listened to the album like four times I'm like what are people talking about and then I listened to it and I was like wow this is really good um so that is that is really neat and yeah it came out uh here at that time when you know we were all uh, you know very hungry for for things to do things to watch things to to 
cry about and be happy about and all those all those sorts of things. So um, it definitely was monumental in that sense. And then um, for me, I found it very interesting because uh, mentioned it a couple of times here. She is working with uh, Aaron Dessner from The National. Um, and apparently Taylor has said in interviews that The National uh, was one of her favorite bands. I'm like, hey, that sounds like me because I also really like The National. Um, and Aaron seems to be real good at this collaboration kind of thing. So uh, he's kind of turned into this uh, master collaborator. Uh, the National just had an album that came out uh, just recently, had a bunch of uh, duets on there, which are really good. And then um, he's been doing a lot of this. So he's worked now with uh, Ed Sheeran, with Gracie Abrams with King Princess. And now he's uh, going back and working with Taylor to do the uh, Taylor versions of those first six albums to uh, wrangle control uh, back. So good for you, uh, Taylor, and good for you, uh, Aaron, because uh, the stuff you're doing together uh, seems to be uh, pretty epic and pretty amazing. And with that, Michaela, let's get to side two. Track number 10, Illicit Affairs. Uh, this song is very literally about having an affair. Uh, it kind of almost turns into like this power ballad, uh, kind of. Um, but I really like it. It kind of treats the affair not as like this like lustful or it doesn't like romanticize it at all. But it almost talks about it like it's kind of this like drug addiction uh, kind of thing that you have. Um, you know that it's eventually going to to break you, uh, but you guess just keep chasing it. And she refers to it as like a mercurial high. Um, it's it's literally like chasing uh, this dragon kind of a thing. And that's illicit affairs. Um, it's it's not my favorite uh, song on the album, but I I really like kind of the the way that she kind of shone light on this particular topic. I thought it was really interesting, and and the lyrics coming through there. Yeah, I don't know. I really like this album. Uh this particular song in this album, because the, the, again, it shines a light that you wouldn't normally think about. I mean, from a very young age, we are told that affairs are bad and they're not good. And this one, uh, she doesn't, she also feels that it's not good, but probably not for the same reasons, because she's like, I'm losing myself the more I get into this. Um, and the idea that there's this delicious dangerousness at the beginning, right? Where, she talks about starting in beautiful rooms and ending in parking lots where it's like, you know, we become paranoid. Um, but more so than that, she knows that uh, there are things w when when you have, a, a, I guess, a long term illicit affair uh, that you're only going to be able to communicate with with that other person. Um, because if you don't want to get found out, you need to keep your mouth shut. So you guys, you know, you 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 create this language that only you two speak. And I really loved that idea um, that, you know, there's one person on the planet that speaks a language that only you know how to speak. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that makes it very complicated when it's not the person that you're supposed to be with and you're doing this covertly. Um, but then more so like knowing that, you know, this person, she's almost cursing this person um, for even existing because not that, she because she can't seem to help herself. Like you said, it's like a drug addiction, right? Like she cannot stop. And she says that she can, but she can't for whatever reason. And likely um, this doesn't talk about all the, the the sex necessarily, right? Which is what you think of, or at least what I think of when I think of an affair, but it, more of this like communication and like this uh, connection that she's feeling that that, that is the drug. And she mm -hmm. knows that this other person knows that she will give up all parts of herself to chase this. And that's why I think um, this song really resonates with uh, probably, you know, young 20 something girls who get into relationships with people who are either emotionally unavailable or legitimately in other relationships um, mm -hmm. because there's a part of you that needs to heal from something else because you, you want to be able to give something so much to a person um, and you know, that can be easily preyed upon by others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that is uh, track number 10 there, illicit affairs. And it goes into a track number 11, invisible string. Uh, this is, uh, kind of based off of this, uh, East Asian myth about, uh, kind of this, uh, red thread that, you know, kind of literally like binds people together, like, like, uh, soulmates. It's kind of like this, uh, soulmates sort of myth here. And that's kind of what this song is, uh, talking about. Um, I really like that the song is called invisible string. And then the composition of the song is like this, this very, uh, plucky sort of orchestral uh, section uh, that goes through and kind of tells the story. And um, it's really kind of like vibrant in the way that it um, sounds and is put together. She's talking about all, kind of like um, all of these colors and how they relate to everything. And it's also a lot of like throwbacks to her um, 
old works and and things like that i think there's a there's a lyric that says something about uh yeah bad was the blood of the song in the cab which obviously is you know hearkening back to that song and um yeah i just think that it's a really kind of kind of interesting kind of almost like um like visual like like poem i guess kind of about uh this uh this sort of thing this in invisible string that uh you know binds two souls together yeah, I liked uh, how she tried to interweave this person against them, uh, against herself, right? Um, and I love the line, cold was the steel of my axe to grind for the boys who broke my heart. Now I send their baby's presence. I mean, um, she refers to that uh, a couple of times in her uh, interviews about this album and that, you know, as she uh, gets older, and things inevitably change. And in this particular song, the things change, but there's this idea that there's a there's something that's always going to connect them. And is it, it it's time, wondrous time, right? And thinking about things in terms of color, like I think you're right. I mean, the visual poetry that she puts down in this song is really splendid. Um, and it makes you I don't know. This is one. This is one I think I could listen to over and over again and pick something else out of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It tells a really great story there um, in that one. And then we're off to a mad woman, um, which is uh, definitely, uh, as you might guess from the title, the most angry uh, sounding here on the album. Um, it has kind of this neat little uh, drum beat that kind of just it churns. It's pretty simple, but it just kind of churns throughout this. Um, and to me, this is kind of a continuation um, from My Tears Ricochet, where it talks kind of about your your uh, arch nemesis here in a way and how you're uh, you're constantly tied together. But this one is like, uh, no, uh, this, this is it. We're done. Uh, it's much more hostile um, here in this one. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's 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 very angry um, and it's very bold and I can see it, you know, kind of kind of going, you know, from the most the vulnerable place that track five was to this one is like the fed up place where you're like, uh, you know, you're kind of you're kind of OK with it. And then you get back to like your house and you're like smashing like wine glasses against the wall because you're so agitated by the person that you just were talking about. Right. Yeah. Uh, I I found this one to be. uh very i don't know i it, listening to it i hadn't heard it um the first before listening to it for the sake of the podcast but listening to it i i reminded me of barbie almost where it was like look what i find interesting is when you tell me i'm mad i get angrier and when you tell me i'm crazy i act more crazy like we are screwed like like as mm -hmm. women like we're not allowed to feel anything uh resembling anything negative um, and the, she sits with that for a whole four minutes long about how that is complete BS and it's not okay. And, you know, people get to just climb all over us. Um, and I know that those are sweeping statements, but they're very real, uh, to a lot of women, um, out in the world. And if you have a problem with that, maybe that, that, that's says that's you, that's a you thing. But I, I did love how this really resonated because I think you're right. I think this was her, this was her answer after like the morning after she was all upset about, you know, my tears ricochet or, uh, you know, and then she comes back and is like, no, you know what? You're mean. And this is uncalled for. And I have a right to be mad. I have, you didn't treat me right. And it doesn't matter. And now you're talking smack about me and that's not okay. Like I love but I'm here for it. And then she's, of course, musing like no one likes a mad woman. I mean, no <laughs> one does like a mad woman. We call them Karens. And really, sometimes they're really being like awful, but sometimes they're righteously angry. And that's OK. <laughs> like, yeah, that's that's right. And there's nothing like a mad woman. Uh, so says uh, Taylor Swift. And uh, so says Michaela right there from track 12. Uh, track 13 <laughs> is Epiphany. Um, this song is super ethereal sounding. It sounds exactly like our cocktail uh, tasted. Uh, it's, it's it's light and airy and it sounds like it came from the heavens. Um, I really like she's uh, paying some homage to her grandfather's uh, World War II service. Um, and I think that that is really great. But the song kind of as a whole, it talks about um, things that you kind of experience personally that um, you you can't 
talk to anyone else about or you won't talk about it or you're just you're just unable to talk about it right you've you've seen things that are that are so bad or so personally traumatizing or um you just don't have like the outlet of people to talk to and i really like kind of that um literal epiphany the name of the song here um it kind of the way that i'd mentioned it's ethereal sounding the vocals here are a little bit um washed out uh, to me and it almost literally sounds like this is coming from like uh being sung from like the the pearly gates right like this is a song like from the yeah. afterlife like like looking at it um and yeah it's a uh, it's a really really great tune it's it's really pretty it's it's really juxtaposed against mad woman yeah i feel like when i first heard this i thought it was very kate bush-esque because of that ethereal mm. kind of really high kind of register but it's it's very light and delicate and she's saying such um resonating visually grounding things uh that really um definitely paint a picture of uh i thought about um uh scenes from things that we've 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 watched in the past uh and then you know history books that talk about the different um like just the different battles um, and what it took to win or lose <laughs> and the mm -hmm. lives that were lost and just very, um, it's very sweeping. And uh, I, I don't want to say epic because that makes it sound good. Um, epically horrible, I think is what I mean. Like the visualizations that are very war driven at the beginning of the song. And then mm -hmm. halfway through the song, halfway through the song, uh, you think about, um, holding your hand through plastic, right? Someone's holding their hand through plastic. And I immediately um, was very jarred and, and almost audibly like, um, uh, like uh, just a, a, like a in breathe of air because yeah. we're not talking about war anymore. And now <laughs> we're talking about uh, a pandemic and how doctors are running around with nurses and all of kind of the first responders trying to keep people alive and not knowing what they're fighting and not, and, and as, as much as the, the chaos had to have been very similar and yet completely different. Um, just, uh, just a, like an homage to all of those things and all of those scenarios and how different and similar they were and are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so that is uh, Epiphany. And we're going to flip over to our last side here, side D. We get into uh, track number 14, Betty, uh, which is the last piece of this uh, love trilogy here. Um, this one is coming from the perspective of the guy here in this uh, love triangle uh, kind of thing. And it's, uh, you know, kind of kind of recognizing the fact that you um you know that you've made a mistake, but you don't really know how to fix it, right? It's it's very much kind of this this young love sort of thing where you know I I know I I done messed up, but I don't know what to do about it. Um, and I really like kind of the kind of the the story elements to this where it's talking about him, you know, kind of showing up at at this party. Um, and to me, it's almost like saying like, look, I know I messed up, and I don't need you to forgive me, but I just need you to know that I know that I messed up, and I'm sorry uh, that I did. And I really like I really like the song. Um, I really like, like I said, kind of the kind of the story that it weaves, and it's very kind of, um, it's almost like a mature look at the innocence of young love. Um, and I really like that. Um, the song to me uh, feels, sounds, and feels more of like a like a you know, kind of a traditional like country song, uh, which I thought yeah. was interesting uh, here. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what I think about uh, Betty there. Um, really good kind of end cap. I really like this uh, this little love trilogy that we get here sprinkled in throughout the album. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, one thing that's not lost on me because this is this is from a point of view of a of a of a boy, um, and Taylor Swift is not a boy. I don't think she identifies as male. So uh, this is definitely something that every every boy who ever wanted to apologize to a girl that they hurt should listen to this song because I think um, there, there, there is a really good roadmap here of uh, how to do it. Um, and I think you're right. It's not saying, you know, forgive me. I need your forgiveness. But saying, I know I messed up and I really, I don't know what I was doing. I have no defense but I, I miss you and I'm sorry. And you don't, you know, I, I mean, at the beginning, he's like, I, you switched your homeroom and that's probably my fault. The worst thing I ever did was what I did to you. And, you know, it's not supposed to make her feel better that he's like, I have to live with that. But the fact that he knows that he's going to live with that the rest of his life. And I like to think 
that they figured it out that, you know, when Betty talks about things in Cardigan, she's 50 or 60 uh, sitting on a porch talking about her, her boyfriend, who's now her husband of 35 years or something. Uh, and that time he went nuts and hung out with some chick in the summer <laughs> and now it's fine. But like at the time, it's the worst thing that could have ever happened and you could have ever done. Right. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm here for this all day. And um, I, I love that he's in the, the, the character in this song is, is, terrified like he's keeps thinking like if i go to your house and you tell me like get the hell away i don't want to have anything to do with you but what if you don't what if you what if you let me in and what it, uh, uh, and he's just and then at the end he's like all right i'm going to the, I'm, I, I showed up i showed up we're just gonna do it 20 seconds of courage that's all you need <laughs> that's all you need that's right absolutely so that is uh track 14 betty and it goes into track 15 uh piece uh which to me i think is the most kind of um i don't know the one that's told, I guess, maybe the most like exclusively from Taylor's perspective um, on the album. Um, it's a little droney uh, sounding. It's got this little like bass lick that kind of comes in and it just keeps repeating uh, there throughout. And it's uh, pretty self-aware kind of about uh, anxiety and and future loves. And, you know, Taylor Swift writes a lot of these songs about, you know, future loves and past loves and, um, you know, kind of how how she messed up or how things went bad. But this one's looking at it a little bit more, um, you know, kind of. Um, taking a little bit more authority over it, right? Like um, she's basically saying that, you know, I can do everything right, but if you know we're going to be together, you're going to have to deal with the fact that there's going to be 30 people outside of my house all the time ready to take pictures of us. And you have to deal with, they're going to write whatever they want in the newspaper about us and about you and about me um, and all that stuff. And I liked um, kind of the openness of that, uh, you know, from her. Uh, a lot of these tracks are very vulnerable to her uh, kind of personally, and I, I really liked that. Um, I will say that this is probably my least favorite song on the album. Yeah? I mean, I think that's fair. I I think, I don't know. I mean, everybody's different, right? I I didn't love this one either. Um, I like the idea behind it more than I like the song, because again, mm-hmm. I think the idea of, hey, I, I'm not going to be able to give you peace. Like, I could give you other things, and, you know, being an old person now, I feel like um, this idea of, you know, who you choose to share your life with, there's got to be a component of peacefulness to it where you feel like you're really coming home. That's like a thing that a lot of people say in, you know, all sorts of movies and songs, right? Um, mm-hmm. They're my home. Um, can you can you find a home uh, with somebody if they have this life that... Um, really doesn't lend itself to peace and quiet and um, without completely uh, isolating yourself, right? Um, There were a lot of relationships uh, during COVID that lasted a lot longer than they would have because there was nowhere else to go and you were just, people were just really lonely. And there were a lot of relationships that ended that people thought would last forever because there was nowhere else to go. And people found out they were really lonely even when they were sitting next to somebody, right? Because they weren't given peace. So I I don't know. I love the idea behind this, but I think you're right. I don't want to say this is the most unremarkable song on the on the list, um, but it's it's not one of my favorites either. So maybe mm-hmm. we maybe we agree. But all the <laughs> all the Swifties don't count, don't come for us. I'm sure. I'm sure That's it's right. amazing. That's right. It is. It is perfectly lovely. Lovely. Yeah. I mean, I just um, over the over the course of the album. Yeah. If I'm if I'm saying which ones are my least favorite, um, it's that. But then it goes into hoax, which is the closing uh, song for the album um, until you get to the the deluxe version, at least uh, as track 16 hoax. Um, and this song I really, really like. Um, it's a very gentle. It's very melancholy. And it's got this little piano riff that kind of carries throughout the song. It sounds like if you played uh, track one, uh, which is uh you are the one what is it called uh the one the one uh if you played the one and then immediately uh let it bleed over into the hoax they feel very much like bookends uh to this album and i like it a lot um like i said it's got kind of the sad piano um that's weaving through and it kind of it kind of ties in like all of the themes of this album right like like young and lost love and regret and um you know hostile you know friendships or working relationships um things like that like escapism like it kind of weaves all of those same themes into kind of this one last song like here is like the like the appendices here of uh the album like this these are all the things we talked about for the last 15 tracks and and here's the the nice little kind of pinpoint uh to it so um yeah i think that this is a really great way to to close out the the album like i said at least until we get to the uh, deluxe uh here yeah 
Yeah. I mean, again, this just being able to be kicked when you're down and um, feeling that way in, you know, as a young girl, I, I, this song really resonated with me. Um, And, you know, certain aspects of this that just, uh, it aches, it was an achy song, but the first, but the one I felt was also achy where the, you know, again, this is a roller coaster of emotions. And the first one, you're like, I'm okay right now, but man, I remember, remember how great it was. And that would have been cool. And then this one is like, you were, uh, this whole idea of that you loved me and believed in me and all these things that I, I believe in you are still true, but yours was a hoax. Yours was a joke. It was not real. Um, and my broken drum, you have beaten my heart. I mean, oh, it's like you just, you knew, you knew you won. So what's the point of keeping score? Like you just, you couldn't leave well enough alone. You had to just hurt me again. Like, wow. And I think a lot of high school kids felt this way, not just girls, but like this, oh, oh, it's so angsty and like sad and definitely, um, a really good end um, until we get to the links, which is the bonus track. Just when you think it can't get any better. Uh, that's right. Yeah. And if you listen to this on day one, hoax is where it ended. Uh, that is the end of the uh, the album here um, until you get the deluxe version, which came out later uh, to stream. And if you have the uh, the vinyl, I'm not sure about the CD, but uh, it's going to come with the bonus track, uh, track 17, The Lakes, um, which uh, Taylor describes as uh, kind of this escapist um, sort of. Uh, section of the album here and this is kind of the the first track of of that i guess and it's a song really about escaping you know kind of from yourself or here um escaping from from herself from taylor swift self um and i i really like it as kind of like this tacked on bit to the album um because it's really like like kind of saying or uh, to me at least it's like like taylor swift is saying okay you know uh here's the album uh, it's over i'm very exhausted from doing this and trying you know this new thing uh creatively i'm tired of being taylor swift and i need to run away and be away from all of this for a while and that's kind of what the lakes uh says to me and can't we all identify with that like i'm i'm tired and i'm tired of doing all of the things that i need to do on a day in uh day out basis and certainly the pressures on myself are not the same as they are on taylor swift but I could certainly certainly identify with the fact that you know I, I've done what I need to do now. Leave me alone and <laughs> let me let me run away for a minute. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she likened this to the Lake District, which is in England, and it's really beautiful there. And um, one of my favorite things about this is she gives us this album. Right, this album goes through so many emotions. It goes through so many lows and different kinds of lows and different kinds of highs. And just thinking about relationships and yourself and all of this work, right? All of this work that I I felt like I didn't really start doing within myself until 2020 when there was nothing else to do but think about yourself and your privilege and all that stuff, right? And so at the end of it, she's like, there's the song Hoax, which is like, basically, you've beaten me into the ground and I'm totally alone. But then in this one, she says, I haven't moved in years and I want you right here. A red rose grew up out of ice frozen ground with no one around to tweet it, while I bathe in cliffside pools with my calamitous love and insurmountable grief. So like, as awful and sad and horrible, I think, as 2020 was for for, for many of us, um, there was still this idea of hope. And if you're able to make progress or feel better or I don't know, whatever your red rose is, no one needs to tweet it for it to be uh, to, to, to have meaning like it, it, if it's growing up and it's growing out of this ice frozen ground, that is whatever symbolism it is for in your life. I think that that has so much meaning and that's so profound and we should all be really grateful and proud of, of the work that's done. Um, and I thought that that was also a piece of this is that she did all this work, um, and it's a completely different sound. It's very, uh, a reinvention for sure um and now she's like i'm going out to the lakes and i'm gonna i'm gonna find my red rose (laughs) that needs to grow you know Mm -hmm. yeah for sure absolutely so that is uh taylor swift's folklore from 2020 so um michaela i don't want to go too long here um with the 17 tracks was a lot to get through but um you'd you'd mentioned a little bit kind of in our in our album break was was this the first time you'd actually like listen to this album 
uh, here this week for the pod? As a whole, yes. Don't come for me, Swifties. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. You were you were just here for the bangers. I totally get that. I totally get that. Um, yeah, as uh, someone who listens through albums, uh, like I said, I've listened to this kind of the day that it came out, and I'd listened to it a time or two since. Um, and when we first, you know, decided to make the jump here to drink the music for the time being, uh, we said uh, we should probably do like something that is timely um, and good. And um, you know, Taylor Swift is of course very uh, very timely here with that huge massive tour uh, that's ongoing, and uh, people are going nuts to get out and see it. Uh, you know, Taylor. Swift seemed like the perfect thing to be covering um and you know i right from the start i said we should cover folklore i really really like that album um i really like taylor swift on on an aside but folklore to me i think it just it speaks to me a lot it speaks to kind of that time and that headspace we were all in in 2020 and um you know kind of the the musical arrangements are things that i i really enjoy uh here in this album as well so um, i think that it's really good and uh hopefully everyone out there listening to this has um enjoyed kind of our conversation about it um it's definitely going to go a long way if you're listening to folklore to mix yourself up a star your night granita so make sure uh, you do that or if you have any other favorite kind of taylor swift uh, cocktails things that go with this or things that go with uh, any of our other stuff maybe you have like a teardrops on my guitar cocktail you want to send her away that would be great we could do that um so i'm glad that you finally got a chance to listen to this michaela any any quick hits on what you think about it or um did it change the way that you look at taylor swift as like a performer or a songwriter or anything like that um yeah i mean i i've always liked taylor swift but i i gotta be honest before before you said, hey, we should do folklore, I was like, mm, Taylor's, I don't know. It seemed like this phenomenon that I thought was fleeting. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Uh, I reserve the right to get smarter every day. This film, this. Michaela is showing herself as a twisty right now is what she's doing. I, I'm, I'm twisty. I'm a twisty. Yeah. Um, this album really knocked my socks off. I mean, it's so good and it's so layered and I've spent the last week and a half because we knew we were going to do this. Um, I spent the last week and a half like re-listening to songs over and over again to try and learn more about and glean more from them. And I feel like uh, I, you know, uh, almost I'm almost cheated because I didn't I haven't been listening to it for the last three years that it's been out. Um and that's a shame, uh, but I'm making up for lost time. I, I think she is so special. Um, and the way in which she collaborates is also really, really special. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't have much more to add. I, I really open to the idea of doing more uh, from her because I think uh, creating a tour like Eras was, is, is really amazing. Uh, that it's, it's like a greatest hits, but she's only 30. I mean, we've got... We've got 30, 40 more years of amazingness that we get to look forward to. And uh, and there's a reason why this phenomenon ha has happened. And it's it's worthy. I mean, she, it's amazing. So thanks for uh, picking this out. I was really surprised that you had folklore and not uh, and not another one of hers, because this is definitely the most folky one um, hmm. that I in the research that I've done so far. Um, so I can't wait to do more. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll have to go back and uh, do the uh, the Taylor Swift versions of her albums. Maybe we'll do that over on Patreon, but I know for sure what we're doing over on Patreon is we're having the polls for what album is coming up next. So you want to make sure um, if you want to have some input or suggest albums, stuff like that, our Patreon is the best way to do it. It's patreon.com slash drink the movies. Go there, get bonus content to make your voice heard in terms of what albums uh, we need to listen to. And uh, we'll uh, definitely uh, take you up on whatever you have to offer there. We definitely appreciate the support. Uh, uh, we definitely appreciate, too, if you send us in pictures of your cocktail. Make a Starry Night Granita. Uh, send pictures our way because it was a really pretty cocktail. Let us know your favorite Taylor Swift album, all that stuff. You can do it on our social medias, on Instagram and threads. It's at Drink the Movies and on Facebook.com slash Drink the Movies. Uh, you can go to our website, www.patreon.com, where we put pictures, episode recaps, all that good stuff up. You can go check that out there. And you want to make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast. You can, uh, A, check out the next uh album that we cover and b uh check out our lobby bar where we got a extra cocktail and a uh, little fun chat going out every monday uh where can people get subscribed you can find us on apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher good pods anywhere where spotify podcasts are distributed and supported um whatever you're listening to right now 
uh, I'm sure there's a subscribe button. Uh, there's also a like button and like a rating button. And if you love us, which we hope you do, uh, we'd love it if you'd leave a five-star rating. Tell your friends. Um, we're really knocked out uh, and excited about being able to talk about our favorite music uh, and a lot of our favorite art forms here at Drink the Movies, Drink the Music. Um, and so if you want to be part of that, um, send us a note. Let us know what you're thinking in terms of either a cocktail that you're loving these days or music that you hear, um, anything like that. We're we're all ears and uh, we're really excited about bringing Drink the Music to everyone. Absolutely. And on that note, Michaela, you just got a brand new record player earlier this week. You need to get yourself to the store so you can stock up on some albums. We'll have to see what the patrons have in store for us for next week and pick out a cocktail or two to go with it. And we'll be back to talk to everyone next time on Drink. Drink. The, the music. music. It might have been fun if you would have been the one. She's a glutton for punishment, just like me. I love it so much. <laughs> that's a uh, folklore, Michaela's version, right there. Yeah, that's right. She's... Thirty more years. I, I, you couldn't blame her if she ran away to the lakes. Just yeah, she's like, I'm done. Stop being I'm done. Out. Done. <laughs>